we're not done. I'm not going to go to my sermon yet. I want to. I want to call on you to pray for two people in particular, and um, I'll tell you both the stories, and then I'll hold this mic up. Anyone wants to pray publicly, come and take this mic. And the reason why is because we got people that you can't see uh, out in Cyberland that are joined with us, and they want to be able to hear the prayers and agree and say the amen. Who knows, maybe one day we'll rig something up where you can pray as well. I don't know how we can work that out, but all things are possible. Now, first of all, we need to pray for Doris's son. And he's an administrator in, a, uh, in the radiology department at Mercy Hospital. And it looked like he had a stroke. It might not be. He's been released already, thank God. But something very scary happened yesterday. and. Uh, he had had a stroke before, evidently, so, uh, but thankfully, I mean, he must be okay because he, uh, he wrote a note to his mother and uh, was released from the hospital and he's lucid, but let's pray for him anyway. Let's pray for that family. They moved out here from California. You could imagine leaving sunny California for good old frozen chosen Iowa, but they wanted to serve Mercy Hospital and they just need our prayers. And then the second thing I wanna pray for is, you all know our West Coast Division. We used to call them the California girls, but then they, one of them started bringing her husband, Carrie. Uh, but it's Cameron and Christine and Cindy and Carrie. And they have a friend who is also, believe it or not, our friend. We just don't know it. This lady was saved out of Mormonism. She watches every single service we have and she prays with us and she's really saved and, and everything like that. But she is in a debilitating situation where she's in constant pain. Her first name is Patricia. Patricia, if you're watching this, we love you and we are gonna join together with you in prayer for your relief and for your peace and for healing. We just sang it. He is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer. All things are possible. We know that ultimately all of us are going to be healed completely, okay? And we all got our aches and pains, but nothing like what she's gone through. So can we please pray together for her? And Jamie would, uh, Baumhofner, would you mind starting that? And thank you, Jamie Northrup. You always do such a great job in ministering the things of God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Father God, we just come to you this morning. Lord, what a treasure she is to us. What a gift. And we are just grateful for her, Lord. And we ask that you give her her heart's desire that her son would be healed and touched. And Lord, we just thank you that even though, Lord, we see uh, so much confusion, uh, stress, just craziness around us, Lord that we can call upon your name in a quiet place and you hear us lord and father i ask for patricia oh lord. father you know her you've known her and you've drawn her out of much deceit uh, much fallen and false religion lord god and father i ask that you would relieve her and lord give her wisdom and understanding give her healing lord jesus please for you are um, Jehovah Jireh, our provider, and Jehovah Rapha, our healer. And I ask that you would lead her in your word and that she would stand upon it. You've given her a special word, Lord. And I ask that you would call out in your name. Amen, Lord. And heal her, Lord, and deliver her. I ask these things in Jesus' in name. Jesus' holy name, Lord God. Thank you, brother. Anyone else want to offer up a white hot prayer? While you're considering that, I just cry out for Patricia. Uh, if one of us suffer, all of us suffer. So we are crying out because she's one of us, oh Lord. And we ask for the relief of our sufferings. And we ask for your consolation and comfort. You have said, I'll never leave you or forsake you, oh Lord God. But I pray for relief from pain, Lord God. I pray for sleep for Patricia. I pray for restoration. Lord, we cry out for a miracle, oh Lord. God, we cry out to him who never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what he did in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 
Jesus is still doing today. You're still healing, casting out demons, forgiving sins, and restoring sinners, oh God. And I pray for Eric, Lord, and his wife Angela and their children, Lord, that you help them through this trial, oh Lord God. I pray that you recover him completely and bless their children, Lord God, who this has been rather uh, difficult for them to make this move out here, Lord God. I pray that you'd touch them and show them how real and how close you are to them, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen. Come here, dear. Thank you. Father, I pray for Patricia, Lord God. Father, you said in your word that you sent your word to heal them, Lord. I ask that you send Patricia a word, Father, to heal her, Lord. Amen. Whatever that word is, Lord. Yes. Father, I also pray for Eric, Lord God, that you would put him back in the head of his priesthood of his home, Lord God. Amen, Lord God. And that he would be healed, Father. That you would show him, Lord, um, hit, wait, that you would show him, Father, his place in the home, Lord. That he is the leader, Lord God, and that you would heal his family, Father, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen, Lord God. Here, Patricia. Thank you, dear. Heavenly Father, we thank you. You are the eternal and everlasting God. Amen, Lord. And nothing escapes your notice, Lord God, and nothing takes you by surprise. That's right. And in the panic, the panic and the fear that have gripped our nation, Lord God, and the confusion and the cross-talk politically, Lord God, in all of this, Lord God, I pray that you will show yourself strong on behalf of those who love you, Lord. Amen. And that, Lord, those of us who know, those, your little children, your own flock, Lord Yes, God, Lord. We hear your voice, and another we will not follow, Lord God. And we thank you that, as you have warned us, not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, and all the more so as we see the day approaching. Amen, Lord. Lord God, we thank you for the privilege of being able to do this, even electronically, Lord God, and that it doesn't take a crowd. It doesn't no. take a hundred people. It doesn't take a thousand people, Lord God. It only takes a few of your little ones, Lord God, gathered for your presence to be with us. And Lord, in that we rejoice. Amen, Lord God, in Jesus' name, thank you. Glory, glory to you, Lord God, almighty, oh Lord. Glory to God for the power of prayer that you told us if any two on earth agree is touching anything they ask, it shall be done for them of my Father. We believe, oh Lord God. And now I ask you to open the word to us, oh Lord, and teach us the words of Jesus. And let us incorporate them just like we ate that bread and drank that cup. We took your body and your blood and incorporated it into our life. And that, but we know that the word is spirit and in its life in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. I think I just turned this off. I'm not sure the light's still on. Is this... Maybe just take it, would you? Because I've, I've got one mic, and two mics would be a little bit much with me. <laughs> the Lord gave me an amplified chest just to go along with my amplified Bible, so I can just project. Praise the Lord. Um, I've been led by God to uh, look at the words and teaching of Jesus. Of course, all of the Bible is the teaching of Jesus. All of the Old Testament is a revelation of Jesus. All of the apostles' uh, teachings and writings were through the spirit of Christ. So there's no distinguishing in that sense from uh, the teaching of Jesus as if someone said, someone one time said, I don't want to hear what Paul says of Peter or James. I want Jesus. But look, everything Paul, Peter, and James said, that's the spirit of Jesus Christ. However, I still got the inclination uh, for the last few weeks to look at to the parables and teachings of Jesus. And today I want to talk about a category of parables that I call the parables of mercy and grace. Okay, parables of mercy and grace. So, and who remembers, you know, what parables are for? Parables are not necessarily to make everything simpler. Parables are not childlike stories that, you know, you just have to 
uh, go, go along like you're a little child or a baby. Parables are given to separate people from into two categories. The one is whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. And they'll benefit because the words of Jesus are life, okay? But the other is like, well, they hear, but they don't hear. And they see, but they don't see. They understand, but they don't get it. And they don't care to get it. It doesn't matter that much to them. The parables are for those for whom it matters. So, you know, I've been reading the Bible for 40 years. I understood very little of it when I first read it. But I knew it was truth. It's life. You cannot extract the meaning out of the Bible. Only the Holy Spirit can reveal it. You can't just pull it out or formulate it. And the Spirit. So we seek the Lord for understanding, right? Now I'm going to go through three parables, I believe, God willing. The first one here is in chapter 18 of Luke. Luke 18, verse 9. You're going to know this one. You've read it and heard it before. He spoke this parable unto certain which trusted, now look at this, in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Now, the subject is righteousness. Or, as it's called, especially Paul, justification. Now, if just, the, just the word righteous really tripped me up for the longest time because I had a more conventional and even Catholic understanding of it, which means righteous is conformity, absolute perfect conformity to the standard. So my big question was, how can a man be righteous or how can a man be justified before God? Because anyone honest at all knows that in, in your heart and even in your actions, well, no, none of us are completely conformed to the standard. Or the way that Paul put it, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. How can a man be righteous? Now, he taught this parable because um, there were certain that trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Now, first century Judaism, I mean, they had their definitions of righteousness. Righteousness was three things to them. And all you had to do is just fulfill those three things and you are righteous no matter what. Number one is prayer. Number two is, and, and by prayer, I mean you kept hours of prayer. You prayed certain prayers. You, you were very fastidious with prayer. And number two was alms. They, they, you did give. You gave, okay. And uh, number three was fasting. Okay, so if, if, if they, the Pharisees, which by the way are not the not horrible, rotten, stinking, demonic people. Okay, a lot of people think, oh, the Pharisees, that's the bad guys of the Bible. Then you miss the point of the Pharisees. You got to remember that the Pharisees were the back to the Bible movement of their day, about 200 years before Christ, when something was happening in the Jewish world called Hellenization, when the pressure was so great to conform to the spirit of the world and the worldliness that there were literally Jewish men getting reverse circumcisions. I can't even fat, I can't picture that and don't want to. The high priest of Israel conformed and changed his name to a Greek name. <laughs> the high priest, complete, com, just like now, complete conformity to the world, okay. And the Pharisees said, no, though the name Pharisee means separate. We're to be separate from the world. Now, I don't think there's a person in this room that has a problem with that. We are to be separate from the world, right? Love not the world or the things that are in the world. Separate yourself. And furthermore, they believed that the word was what would separate them. And so they actually categorized the whole of the Bible into 613 commandments. <laughs> I don't know why. I keep on spitting. All right. And that was their life's goal, to be in conformity to every one of their commandments. That's how they were going to be, make themselves righteous before God and purify the nation. And they had this belief that if we could get everyone to repent just one day, the Lord would restore us back to the top, the King David and all that stuff. The Pharisees, now, they, were, they believed a lot of the things that Jesus believed. In fact, the Pharisees were closest to Jesus 
theologically. The problem was 150 years later, just like anything else, like if you went back 150 years to a Methodist church, you'd think you were walking into this church. It was full of the Holy Ghost, calling on people to repent and turn to the Lord and everything like that. Movements get calcified and they change uh, subtly and they lose the heart of what they're all about. So by the time of Jesus, the Pharisees had cal calcified. Like I just told you, they had righteousness figured out. Prayer, alms, fasting. That's it. Keep your prayer times, periodic fasts, and alms. Um, now, if you remember the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus actually attacked all three of those when he talked about true spirituality. He did not attack the idea of prayer or alms or fasting. He attacked the idea of prayer to be seen by men. Alms, do you make sure people know you gave? Fasting, he went to the heart, see? Fasting, you go out to steak and shake with your friends and they're all having a good time and you got a long face. And, well, what's wrong? Oh, I'm fasting today. <laughs> he said, don't do that. Let you, everything you do be seen by God and let the Father who sees in secret have a secret life and then the Lord will reward. That's true spirituality, okay. Now, in this parable, he gets to the core. What really is righteousness? And how, and more importantly, who is going to be justified before God? How can a man be justified before God? So here's a parable. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one, a Pharisee, and the other, a publican. Now, what's a publican? Well, a publican, you remember, that Israel, uh, Judea is an occupied country. It's, re, it's a province of Rome now. It's under the enemy. Now, how would you like it if an enemy took over Iowa and they wanted to raise money, so they came to me. Pastor, you're a pastor. You know a lot of people. Want to work for us and exploit your neighbors, turn their names in, tell us how much they have, where they have it, and we'll use the full power of our state to squeeze that money out of them. And you could make a great living. You, you could get a franchise of tax collection. We'll back you up. And uh, what, what did you think it'd be if I go, yes, absolutely. I want, I've always wanted to be rich. And I betrayed my nation. That's publicans. Now, in the, in the world of Pharisees, they didn't believe a publican could, could even go to heaven. They certainly did not believe that a publican should even be allowed into the, into the temple. And in their synagogues, they wouldn't let a publican pray. But in Jesus' parable, he, see, he puts a test case, two people, a Pharisee, a holy one, who devoted his whole life to keeping all 613 commandments, who lived... Uh, a cycle of prayer, fasting, and alms, and who was the back to the Bible separate movement of the day, and the most evil person you can imagine, a traitor. Now the Pharisee stood and prayed thus, but look at how Jesus puts it, with himself. He's, he's praying to himself. He doesn't realize that. God, I thank you. Uh, so far, so good. We should all thank God, right? But what's he thanking God for? I thank you that I'm not like other people. I'm not an extortioner. I'm not unjust. I'm not an adulterer. And then he looks around and goes, and I'm not like him back in the church, the back of the church there. <laughs> I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Righteousness. By the standards of the day, this is the righteous one. Now the publican, he stood so far off, and he wouldn't even so much as lift his eyes unto heaven. But he smites on his breast. The heart is the very seat of sin. He goes, ah! <laughs> saying, God have mercy on me. A sinner. And now everyone's waiting. Which one's going to be justified? And everything that they were taught to expect was turned on its ear. 
Jesus said, I tell you, this man, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. Well, what does this teach us about the doctrine of justification? Well, number one, it teaches us the very same thing Paul would go on to elaborate on quite a bit in Romans and Galatians. By the works of the flesh shall no man be justified in the sight of God. Justification cannot be obtained by works. There is no way you could ever do enough. Even your prayers, even your fasting, even your alms, as Jesus pointed out in the Sermon on the Mount, are tainted by self. There's no way you could ever conform totally to the standard of God, not completely. And even if you ever did get to that point, what are you going to do about all the breakages before? What this parable teaches is that justification is a gift of grace. There is no way that you can earn it. If a man is going to be justified before God, it's got to come from a gift of God. He cannot put God in debt. It's complete grace. And grace is such a beautiful word. It's such a powerful, potent word. God will give fallen humanity what they don't deserve and they could never give to themselves. God is good. It is great. The, 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 the um, Exodus 34, which gets repeated in so many psalms, the Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love and mercy and grace. The man, but, what, but the other thing this teaches is the state of the heart. You couldn't get further from God than the Pharisee. He stands up, and basically Jesus is saying, look, in effect, he's just praying to himself. That's all he's doing. His prayer doesn't even go to the ceiling. God doesn't hear that prayer. But why? Because the basis of his approach is full of works, full of self, full of pride. He's thankful to God, not for a free gift, not for love, not for mercy, not for forgiveness. I'm thankful that I'm so good. He has no idea. One of the ultimate Pharisees in the Bible, Saul, Saul of Tarsus. And he says, but humanly speaking, man, you couldn't find fault with me. He talks about it. Man, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. You talk about back to the Bible. He was back to the Bible. You talk about separate. He was separate. You talk about unworldly. He was unworldly. But there's another sense in which he is as worldly as you can get. Because what is worldliness? At its core, it's independence from God. Look, if you can justify yourself, you don't need God. I mean, hell is going to be chock full of really, really good people. It's the tragedy of a, Now, we know it'll be full of evil people. But hell is going to be overflowing with really, 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 really externally good people. I like what Paul said, too, about the law. You know, by the law, I was, I was this and that. You couldn't, you couldn't get me on murder. You couldn't get me on adultery. You couldn't get me on this. But then he gets to the 10th commandment. And he literally says, it slew me. Why would the 10th commandment slew you? Because it's spiritual. You shall not covet. You should not desire or lust for anything at all that God himself hasn't given you. And Paul got honest with himself. The spirit must have touched him. Very, the spirit was convicting him very strong, like the spirit said to him, why are you kicking against the pricks? And he says, that commandment was the end of me. Because it just, his whole project of trying to fulfill righteousness just collapsed right there. And he would say, and this goes along with Jesus' teaching, everything I once boasted in, circumcised the eighth day, stock of Israel, tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, as preserving the law externally blameless, he says, now I count it but dung compared to the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. 
Justification is not attainable other than as a gift freely given by a gracious God, and it's all wrapped up with forgiveness, forgiveness of sins. Now, who's the farthest from God? The person that does not believe they need forgiveness. You cannot get farther from God than that. That is the unforgivable sin, to not believe that you can, you can be forgiven, that you need to be forgiven. So that's the first parable, mercy and grace. The parables are really, really, really a lot more simpler than a lot of people think. In my view, there's only one major, major, major thought that runs through each one of them. Now, the second parable, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew 20, a parable of mercy and grace. Now, this one really tripped me up when I first came to Christ. And by the way, if you ever read a passage of scripture where there's one part of it that really trips you up, that's awesome because that's where the Holy Spirit is really dealing with what's wrong with you. Okay, the Holy Spirit is getting you on something. And you got to work with God. You got to wrestle with him. And he, when he finally gives you the breakthrough, that changes you. Seriously, this, this one really bothered me. The kingdom of heaven is like the man that is a householder who went out early in the morning to hire the laborers in his vineyard. And when he agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. A penny a day is a full day's wage. Okay. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. He said unto them, you go also into the vineyard. Whatever's right, I'll give you. And they went their way. He went down to Home Depot, picked up a bunch of guys, put them in the back of the pickup, sent them out to work. You guys look like you could need, you need a job. Whatever's right, I'll give you. Again, he went out the sixth and the ninth hour and did likewise. Wait a minute, it's getting late in the day. They worked 12 hours, sun up to sundown. In verse 6, you just don't expect this. He went out the 11th hour. <laughs> don't you have your crew by now? Oh, man, he goes down to Home Depot. There's still a few people sitting around waiting to be hired. He found others standing idle. And he says unto them, Why are you standing here all day long idle? And they say, Because no one's hired us. And he says unto them, You go also into the vineyard. And whatever's right, you'll get it. Well, that's not a commitment, is it? It's not a price. He doesn't give a specific price. He just says, I'll give you what's right. And they believed him. So when the evening was come, the Lord of the vineyard said to his steward, Call the laborers, give them their hire, beginning from the last to the first. And when they came that were hired about the 11th hour, lo and behold, they received a penny, which was a full day's wages. 50 bucks an hour, let's say. <laughs> Whoa! Now here's what goes on in people's minds. Because the biggest opposition in the fallen human race of all, in my view, is opposition to grace. We want to earn it. So the people that worked 12 hours, 12 times as much as the first people go, wow, they got a full hour? Then by all reckoning, I'm going to get 12 hours pay, or 12, 12 pennies, because I worked 12 hours. And when they came that were hired the 11th hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should receive more. But all they received, likewise, every man was a penny. They got a full day's wages. When they received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and you made them equal to us, which have borne the burden and the heat of the day. In other words, they can't believe it. What? This is not fair. Really? We didn't, we, we worked longer than they, and all we got is a day's wages, and they, they only worked one hour, they got a full day? What? 
Now, here's where the punchline is. I used to say the same thing to him, to the Lord. What? That couldn't be right. How could you do that to people? But then I really got thinking about what he's saying. Verse 13, he answered one of them and said, Friend, I didn't do you any wrong. Didn't you agree with me for a penny? Now, this is one of the teachings that this brings. The least, at least, everyone is going to get what they deserve. No one gets less. That's a complaint. Everyone is going to get what they deserve. Now, how many here want what you deserve? <laughs> I don't want what I deserve. I want grace. I'm mercy. He says, is it not lawful for me to do what I will with my own? Hey, it's my money, my wealth, my vineyard. I can do whatever I want with it. Well, what does God want to do for the fallen human race? Well, he'd like to give mercy. He'd like to give grace. He'd like to bring us into something that we could never deserve, we could never earn, that we're not worthy of. That's what he'd like to do with his wealth. Isn't it lawful for me to do with one of my own? And then he speaks back to him, pushes back. Is your eye evil because I'm good? An evil eye in the Bible is an envious or a, uh, a greedy or a... Um, what do you call it? A miserly eye is an evil eye. Now they're keeping score on everybody. They're comparing themselves to everybody. Wait a minute. If he got one penny, I get 12. That's not true. A person has an evil eye. An evil eye cannot receive grace. It, has, it, it believes everything has to be according to accounting. Everything has to be according to what you earn. Okay. So the last should be first and the first last, for many are called, but few are chosen. Now, here's another thing. And this is perhaps the main, main thing in this parable. The question is, why, oh why, did the landlord go out one hour before closing to hire people? You think he needed them? He didn't need them. They needed him. Translate that to you and me. Why are we saved? Why are you sitting here right now? You think God needed us? A zillion eons before we came along, he was at peak joy. He needs nothing and nobody. Why did he do it? Why did he say? I often ask this question. It bothered me. My family is rather large. I said, God, why did you show me? Why did you turn me aside to see a burning bush? Why did you give me a concern about my soul, my state? Why me? And there is no good answer for that other than can I not do with what my own whatever I want to do? <laughs> Is your eye evil? Because I'm good. Well, a guy asked me to quit yelling on the, on the pulpit. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> God's good. Grace is good, right? <laughs> Man, no wonder we sing amazing grace. It is amazing. <laughs> If it ever stops being amazing, then you're out of the will of God. Because it's incredible. It's staggering. I can't compare myself with anybody else. I can't measure and gloat like that God, the Pharisee in the temple. Thank you that I'm not like him. I couldn't do that. There is a, that is an evil eye, man. That guy is looking at things the wrong way. It's grace. The Lord is merciful and gracious. See, the, the mercy and grace are twins. They go together, but they're two different things. Mercy is, in a sense, negative. 
You deserve wrath. You deserve punishment. You deserve hell. But in God's love, he showed us mercy. The mercy of God is Jesus hanging between heaven and earth. That's the mercy of God. Mercy is negative. He will not give you what you deserve. Now, grace is positive. There is a riches in Christ that none of us could ever even dream of having a claim to. We're the last people to come in the line at the end of the day. And we're always stunned by what he does for us and how he speaks to us and how he comes to us in all of our needs. It's pure grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. The Lord is gracious, abounding in loving kindness and mercy and truth and forgiving thousands and thousands and thousands sin and transgression and iniquity. I think of David's psalm. 51, which is his repentance after Bathsheba, he says, Have mercy according to thy loving kindness, according to thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgression, for uh, against you only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. Did you know that all sin is against God? Every one of them? I told that one time in a Bible study, and someone challenged that, and in a good spirit, they said, how, how can you say all sins against God? What about King David when he killed someone and stole their life, their wife? Wasn't that a sin against that guy and his wife? And I thought about that for a minute, and the spirit gave me the answer. Yeah, but what is a man but the image of God? And who is the author of marriage? Who brings the two together? and makes them one. For this cause shall the man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. So all uh, sins are against God because everything good comes from God. Now, uh, let me go to the last one because I told you I'd give you three. Luke 14. And this is the same subject but a different angle. This is a parable of grace but it's also a warning. And the warning is against presumption. There's a lot in the Bible about presumption. What is presumption? You make an assumption about something. Just like the guys that worked for 12 hours, they assumed. They assumed something. They were presumptuous. The Pharisees who were the closest to Jesus theologically. He didn't even mess with the Sadducees. You know what the Sadducees were? Liberals. They didn't believe in, anymore in death and resurrection and life after life. All it was was a moral code to them. Jesus didn't even talk to them. It was the Pharisees. Why? Because they were the closest. And, but they were presuming. We've got righteousness figured out now. We've got a system in which you could always be righteous according to works, according to our works. And they made such presumption that these par see, these parables when first told rocked the people that heard them. Because you're all getting ready for Jesus to condemn the publican in the temple and maybe kick him out or something. No, he's the one that's justified. <laughs> and you're all getting ready for the last workers to get 12 pennies. Are you kidding? What a great day. Nope. Everybody, everybody gets at least what they deserve. But some people get more. That's called grace. Not less, more. And how, do you, how, how could God do that in his economy? You know how. The law had to be satisfied, and God is fair and just and cannot violate his justice and sweep our sins under the carpet. So how is it that he can give us more than we deserve and still be a righteous God? Jesus died on the cross in our place. Christ took our place, the just for the unjust, to bring us to God. Now, 14 is a warning about the presumption, okay? Uh, so let me just start here, uh, verse 7. He put forth a parable to those which were bidden when he marked how they chose out the chief rooms 
See, in the ancient world, uh, there was a very specific uh, table etiquette. The mat, whoever threw a feast sat at the head of the table. The most favored guests sat on either side of them, and then it just decreased down to, you know, <laughs> the last one at the foot of the table. They're all reclining around table. And Jesus noticed how they, they, they were like position takers and heading up, crowding up to the head of the table. In other words, presuming that they were in favor. And so he get, first he gives a mini parable. When you're bidden of any man to a wedding, don't sit in the highest room. There's a more honorable man than you be bidden of him. What if you take the top seat and then one of his best... Well, even greater friend comes in, and you get sent down. I don't know about you, but I don't want to get sent down. I'd rather be sent up. And he that bade thee and him come and say to thee, Give this man place, and you'll begin with shame to take the lowest room. You know, it'd be much better to be in the lowest room and be elevated then take the highest seat in presumption and get sent down. And when you're bidden, he says, go and sit in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee comes, he may say unto you, friend, go up higher. <laughs> then you will have worship in the presence of them that sit and meet with thee. Well, it's honor, okay, which honor is important. For whoever exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. Then he said also to them, that him, when you make a dinner or a supper, don't just call your friends, nor your brethren, nor your kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made to thee. Well, that's the most natural thing in the world. Have a feast, bring all your friends. And you, it, you're thinking, you know, you don't even have to calculate it. It's just normal human relations. Yeah, chances are they'll have a feast, and I'll be invited. And we'll invite these people, and these people, and these people, and these people. Who knows how many feasts we'll get invited to? That's awesome, right? That's normal. But Jesus said, no, don't do that. Now, guess what? In the parables, the feast is your religion. And the first thing he's warning about is self-serving religion. Get yourself in position. In comparison with other people. When you make a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind, the people that no one else wants to have anything to do with. Don't use your religion as a personal elevation. Humble yourself. Go to the people no one else will talk to. And you'll be blessed, he says, for they can't repay you. Do something for someone that they can't repay. But you will be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Now remember, Pharisees believe in the resurrection. Actually, they're looking forward to the resurrection. That's a tenet of Pharisaic and Judaic faith. I believe in the resurrection of the dead. It'll be the resurrection of the just. So as soon as Jesus said the resurrection of the just, one of the guys sitting at the table, it triggered him, and out popped a blessing. And when one of them sat at meat with him, heard those things, he said, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. And that is a good blessing. I like that blessing. I might even use it sometime. All right. <laughs> and from his perspective, and from our perspective, because we're just in continuity, the climax of history is a messianic feast on a holy mountain after the defeat of death and antichrist hold your finger in luke 14 and look with me to see where this guy's coming from and what triggered him and what caused this ejaculation of praise blessed is everyone that'll be there at the uh, at the feast isaiah 25 
Verse 6. In this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things. Already sounds good, doesn't it? He says, a feast of wine on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, choice steaks. Wine on the lees well refined. And he shall destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. And he will swallow up death in victory. And the Lord will wipe away tears from all faces. And the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth, for the Lord hath spoken it. This is what caused this man such excitement. This was the anticipation of everyone that had any kind of true belief in God. Yes, the feast, the climax of history. The ground of all true joy and happiness. And I'm going. I'll be there. That's the thinking. The feast. That's why so many of the parables are about feasts. Wedding feasts. Or, it's all pointing to the messianic feast on the holy mountain. At the time when the Lord destroys Antichrist with the breath of his mouth, the brightness of his coming, and death is finally conquered once and for all, and the veil is removed off the earth. And these people in their Pharisaic faith, which was right on so many things, just couldn't wait. So this is the backdrop for this parable. See, he says, blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. So, he assumes that he's going there. Not only that, but he assumes that everyone there is going to be just like him. No doubt a Pharisee, or at least a, a Jew, observant Jew, a kosher, and uh, he just can't wait. Just like now. Okay, guess, guess why this parable is so important. Right now, if you, if you interview people, are you going to heaven when you die? So many people across America have had just enough religion that they're sure. It's all good. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there. So here's the parable. A certain man made a great supper and bade many. The problem is you couldn't say what date the supper is going to be on. Okay, you have to find out who's coming first, see? So it's all nebulous. You just got to gotta send out invites, and then an RSVP has to come back. And then when it's ready, because it takes a long time to get it ready, you got to slaughter a cow, and you got to clean it, and you got to cook it and everything. But then finally, when it's ready, you send out another invitation. You were invited. It's time now. He made a great supper and bade many, and he sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for everything's now ready. Now, I like that phrase, too. <laughs> everything's ready. Jesus did it all. Is that not what we celebrated this morning? And they all, with one consent, began to make excuse. The first said to him, I bought a piece of ground. I must needs go and see it. I pray they have me excused. Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen. I go to prove them. I pray they have me excused. Another said, I married a wife. I can't come. <laughs> you know, these are lame, right? This is the Holy Land. You don't just buy a piece of ground suddenly. I mean, it's a long time process because there's laws about land there, okay? Uh, and you didn't check it when you bought it? You're going to go inspect it? Lame. Five yoke of oxen? You got a John Deere? Wow, you didn't try it? You didn't test it? You got to go test it? You married a wife? Well, can't you bring her? The, see, here's the point. They all were sure they were going to be there. There is no question about it. Blessed are all those that are at the feast. And Jesus is warning them about that presumption. Just like so many people are sure they're going to be in heaven. And it's not dramatic, evil, rotten, lousy things that kept him out of the feast. Just petty things. Excuses. 
So he says, another said, uh, uh, verse 21, that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house being angry said to the servant, go out quickly into the streets and lands of the city and bring in here the poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind. Remember his reference to them earlier? The servant said, Lord, it's done as you commanded. And yet there's room, there's still room. The Lord said unto the servant, go out into the highways and hedges, compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of these men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Now this is a parable of grace, but a parable of warning. The grace part is that they're even invited. <laughs> that they're actually friends of the landowner. That they're actually good friends in a privileged position. The first people that he would invite. This is Israel. But now, it's much of confessing Christianity. They're sure they're going to be there. And they're also sure the only ones that are going to be there are people just like them. They can't conceive of anyone else being there. It's them and them alone. The back to the Bible movement of the day. But between the invite and the RSVP and then the feast, it can take longer than you think. It's not that they did something so awful. It's not that they apostatized and picked up another religion. Then what is this, this, what is this teaching us? Oh, to them, this is just another feast. It's important, but not too important. It's, uh, They've been invited to feast before. They've had feasts before. What's that mean? Well, Judaism in the synagogues all over the world, the law of Moses was taught all the time. These people were taught this whole thing. They were very, very familiar with the end time messianic banquet. They were sure they're going to be there. But when Jesus came to announce, OK, everything's ready. <laughs> It was important, but not, not that important. And the reason that I say that that's what kept him out is because then he goes to the people who would never have dreamed that they would ever be invited to something so sumptuous, so rich, so free. Go out to a beggar. Hey. King's having a party. You want to come? The first thing the beggar says, you talking to me? Are you kidding me? <laughs> a blind man. <laughs> Take him by the arm. Come on, the king's having a party. He wants you there. What? <laughs> In other words, to them, that feast is everything. It's the best thing that ever happened to them. They could not have conceived membership and partnership at that table. They could not believe it. Now, what, what do we have on this table? <laughs> oh, just another communion. <laughs> this is a feast. So, uh, the lessons of the story, I'll close. Some people have a much better opportunity to get to heaven than others do. I've often talked about this, like I was born in America, in Minnesota. I was raised in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. There are churches everywhere. I knew there was a God. My parents taught me there's a God. There's a heaven, there's a hell. They threw in purgatory. Well. We didn't know. But like everything in my life militated toward me coming to this point of becoming a Christian. I still marvel at the grace of God. I could have said, no. Or I could be like these people. Oh, yeah, I've already been there, done that. You know how many people out there 
They heard about the rapture back in the 1980s when Tim LaHaye wrote this fiction series called Left Behind. Already been there, done that. That worried me, by the way. Anytime you fictionalize the things of God, you know. But they were into it at the time. But you know, you can outgrow all that stuff. You just go on. You're going to go to heaven when you die? You better believe I'll be there. This is the number one lesson. Some people have a much better opportunity to go to heaven than others do. These were the chief men, the people who expounded on scripture that Jesus is talking to, who knew about the messianic banquet, who were so excited that they exclaimed right there, interrupted Jesus, blessed is everyone. But number two lesson, the people that are so privileged for the most part, hope they'll get there. Vaguely plan on getting there. Expect to be there. I, I'm now completing almost 40 years of ministry. You and I have seen a steady stream of people various times in their life, excited about God, excited about the things of God, ready, oh yes, do you want to go to heaven? Yes, the rapture, yes, they assume they're going to go there somehow. It's just an assumption. So you can ask them, you know, do you want to go to heaven? Yes. <laughs> you think you'll become a Christian? You ever expect to at some point? But the third point of this parable is most of those with the special privileges, according to this parable, don't even make it. Don't end up going. And the reason why is, is the most important part of this parable. Why? Well, they did want to go. But not enough to put it first. But before everything else. They didn't want to go so bad that they'd accept it in the package of Jesus. Yes, I want to go, but not enough to seek it more than anything else. They just didn't see it the same way the paupers did. You know, to the paupers, salvation is the greatest thing that ever happened. To the blind, I mean, being able to see Jesus, sit at that table. I can see the king walking among the rows. Hey, you enjoying the feast? Yes, yes, master. I love it. They don't know which fork to use. They're eating peas with their knife. <laughs> but they love it. <laughs> uh, how do you like the food? It's the best food I ever had. I notice you're not wearing your rags. No, the Lord gave me, the Lord of the feast gave me a new suit. <laughs> Like we sing, I am clothed with righteousness, hallelujah, by the grace of God. But these ones, oh yeah, just another feast. He gets me and I get him back. We got this thing, we all invite each other to each other's feast. Just another communion service? Just another meeting? It's presumption that this is warning about. How bad you want it? You willing to lose friends over it? You're willing to trash your reputation for it? To bear reproach? Not as works. It's a measure of how much you want it. That's what I see in this parable. Do you want this? Do you want this more than anything? Because the test comes between the RSVP and the actual feast. This is a constant theme in all the parables. The, the virgins are waiting for the wedding. Well, when will it happen? Well, you never know exactly when. They didn't, they didn't do like we do with everything on the clock. You just got to be ready. Well, wait a minute. We were ready a long time ago, but it took so long we fell asleep and ran out of oil. And you know, something really bad happens between the invitation and the final call. Now, guess what, everybody, and you out there? We are at the final call. The rapture is going to happen pretty soon. 
And I pray to God that you will want God, his kingdom, and partnership in this messianic feast more than you want anything else on this earth. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the parables of Jesus, of mercy, of grace, the warning against presumption. Pour out your spirit on all of us. Breathe your breath of life on us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all.